Hey guys, Buildzoid here, and today we're going to be taking a look at the GTX 1060 Extreme Gaming, or Gaming Extreme, I'm not sure which order it goes in, from Gigabyte. They need to find a better name for their GPU lineup, seriously. Extreme Gaming, what the hell? Oh, and it's spelled with an X, not with an E. They, they leave the E out, because, you know, X's are more extreme than E's are. Anyway... We're looking at a GTX 1060, which means that it's going to have three major voltages. The first one being, well, the most minor one of which is this one, which is the 1 volt PLL. This is necessary for the card to run, but has absolutely no impact or use when overclocking, and as such you can pretty much ignore its existence. Then, up here, you will find the memory VRM, and I shouldn't highlight the capacitor bank with it, because I'm not actually sure which part of what, which capacitors go where on this. But... That's your memory VRM. I know like it looks part like it's part of this the, the rest of this block right here, but we'll go on the back of the PCB and you'll see exactly why it's not actually uh, why this whole thing isn't one VRM, it's actually two, arranged to look like one VRM, probably because it looks better on photos. So uh, that means the rest of this is your vCore. And those are the only major VRMs on this card, even though there is a ton of stuff right here. And, well, that's mostly because these HDMI ports, which are on these two switches right here. Um, and apparently these things are for VR. But I don't care about VR, so I have... So I'm not really sure what the point of that is. But apparently it's beneficial to have your HDMI ports coming out the front of your case or something. So, yeah, that's what that's there for. Um... And now let's move on to the parts of the card I actually care about. Which means we need to take a look at the back of the PCB and figure out why it is that the... Damn it. Why it is that the... There's actually two VRMs here, not one. So, that's the wrong button. This one. Perfect. Um, you know, if we look right on the back here, we see that we have one, two, three, four, five, six seven MOSFETs. So that lines up with the seven phases we had on the other side, but we also have one, two, three, four, five, six driver ICs. So that means that this 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 right here doesn't get a driver and therefore shouldn't be able to function, um, assuming that, you know, yeah. But the thing is, this right here is part of the memory VRM, which is controlled by a different voltage controller, so, yeah, so this is actually a 6 plus 1, not a 7 phase or whatever it is that they were trying to do. It does look very weird for a 6 plus 1, but it is still a 6 plus 1. Incidentally, the 290X actually has a kind of similar issue on its layout. Um, yeah, that's that random scribble because I can't get the layers to switch properly. Anyway, um, zoom out a bit. There we go. That's more like it. This right here is for your memory. And it is controlled by this right here. And that right there should be a UP166 something. I'm not sure if it's a 1665 or if it's a 1666. Um, because I can't actually read the lettering on that thing. However, the 1665 and the 1666 both have the exact same uh, pinouts. So if you wanted to actually volt mod this thing, it's a simple case of doing... Well, that's assuming... Also, if you're actually going to follow my advice on volt modding this, I recommend you actually check that it's a 1665. But as you can see, that, that, that those all look awful lot like sixes. But basically, it's... Let me check. Dot is right here. That pin. And that dot down here on... Well... That dot, right there, is used to identify which orientation ICs should go in. So that's why that exists. It's same as that notch on your... Well, no, CPUs have outright notches, but if you've ever worked with an AMD CPU, they have like that little golden triangle on one edge. That's sort of the same idea here. Basically, this pin right here is the feedback pin, which means you're going to want to measure the resistance from that pin to ground, and then choose the appropriate uh, potentiometer to, you know, tweak it. Um, or you can do a potentiometer with three lines, where one line goes to V-Core, one line goes to GND, and the middle line of that potentiometer will actually go to the uh, 
go to the sense the the feedback pin and then you can actually pull the voltage down as well as up and the only issue with that setup is well at, well the benefit of that is that you can just use a really small potentiometer so like a 1k ohm will work on pretty much anything uh, which is what I have I have 1k's or I th 2k's I think but the problem with this setup is that the card will initially boot at voltages at which it won't start so you'll have to tweak up the you'll basically have to boot up the card once pull the voltage up while it's malfunctioning then reset the system and then it sh should start working again that's the same kind of way I did mem that's the same way I did my memory vault mod on the GTX 570 uh, where I am actually using a way smaller potentiometer than I should be if I was doing it the other way. If you're doing it the other way, you want your potentiometer to be about 10 times the resistance from this pin to ground. So, yeah. And incidentally, that is pin 11. So, yeah, that's feedback on both the 1665 and 1666. Um, though, do make sure that they are actually the 166 or, you know one of these two before you follow this. If it's a different voltage controller, I'll happily give you the data sheet for it. So, moving on, this right here is the age-old UP95... UP9511. And this thing has been used by NVIDIA, is brand new from Ubic, basically exists, well, not Ubic, but from U UPI Micro, and this thing pretty much exists exclusively to be used on NVIDIA cards. It first came out on the Founders Edition GTX 1080. It's been used on a variety of cards since then. Uh, it is an eight-phase voltage controller. Oh yeah, wait, I forgot to mention something. This thing right here has integrated drivers. That's why there's no driver IC up here. And also, the, this extra phase, um, this has that has integrated drivers for two phases. So this thing can make two phases just as is. You can literally just hang two phases off of that. Don't need any more supporting circuitry. Um, but this right here, this is a UPI, UP9511. This thing produces eight phases, but can't actually drive them, which is why it needs driver ICs, because putting drivers into this thing would actually lead to this thing being huge and extremely hot. So, yeah. That, that's why this actually has drivers, whereas that comes with, it, comes with its own drivers inside. A uh, cool thing about this thing is, this is actually a pretty, like, this is a pretty advanced voltage controller. I mean, it is the newest thing from UPI. And, you know, you have eight phases up to, well, actually, I'll quickly pull up the data sheet for it because I can't remember off the top of my head, even though I've looked at this thing several times before. Um, eight phases. Okay, we'll just pull up the data sheet. Eight phases up to, wait, I wanted the switching frequency. I'm off the top of my head, I think it goes up to f two megahertz. Hmm. MHZ. Okay, it can't find megahertz. Seriously? There are no megahertz in this... Okay, KHZ. Oh, great, so search doesn't work. Huh. Okay, it seems to only go up to 600. Five, nine... Yeah, they don't mention switching frequency anywhere. I was convinced this thing went up to two, two, thousand, two megahertz. It seems to only go... Is this a different version, perhaps? Shouldn't be. There should only be one 9511. Well, there's only one 9511, so what the hell? Hmm. So it does only run at six, uh, 600 kilohertz maximum switching frequency. Unless I'm missing something in the data sheet. It's actually a pretty slow controller. Because you can, like, the really high-end stuff goes all the way up to 2 megahertz, at which point most MOSFETs don't work anyway, so it doesn't matter. But, yeah, that's uh, that's uh, interesting. I thought it would go higher. Um, 
So yeah, it goes up to 600 kilohertz. Not that that's a huge deal. GIMP is spazzing out for some reason. I will proceed to ignore that. Hopefully the video doesn't become even more of a disaster while that happens. Uh, so yeah, six phases. So basically what Gigabyte has here is six phases, maximum switching frequency, 600 kilohertz. They're probably running it at 300 though. Nobody really wants to run 600 kilohertz just because it wastes efficiency for no good reason. And if you were to volt mod that voltage controller, you would be looking for... And that sucks. I need a bigger version of that image. Perfect. So you would be looking for... Uh, nope. There we go. Pin FB, which is... This one right here, which is pin 31 of 40. So, yeah. You want pin 31. Oh, wait, no, that's the wrong one. Oops, I misread the orientation. Dot is here, whereas their dot was down here. So that means pull it up, which means that you want that pin. Well, pin 31. And I really should use a smaller brush size, except I don't have the bindings for that right now. And if I try to go off screen, this is going to be a disaster, which is where all the tools are, obviously, because... Yeah, so that's pin 31 to volt on that one. Same procedure as the UP166, whatever it is. Um, so, you know, feedback pin mod, potentiometer, ground, that, that kind of deal. Let's finally look at what the actual VRMs are made of, which is probably what most people came here to, to see, not me waffling about a uh, voltage controller. So, um, I did not go and bother with doing the calculation for this VRM right here for a very simple reason. This right here is an alpha and omega semiconductor G6414. And these things are limited to 30 amps on the package. And that basically means you can't put more than 30 amps continuously through one of these MOSFETs. Um, and I also can't, can't find anything that would describe how you deal with the package rating in non-continuous scenarios like, you know, a high side MOSFET. So, yeah, I'm just going to go with that 30 amp rating because, well... You know, I'd rather be underestimating the VRM rather than telling you that it can ha do something it can't. The cool thing is, though, that these MOSFETs are incredibly efficient, so you basically don't have to worry about cooling them at all. And I also think that efficiency is part of the reason why the package is limited to such a low current, because, interestingly enough, how a MOSFET is packaged will influence its ability to turn on and off quickly, and generally the more current the package is able to handle, the less, uh, the slower the MOSFETs are to turn on. Because in this same package size, you can actually get MOS, like in this same MOSFET size, you can get like up to 100 amps of current available. So it's very much that this MOSFET is optimized for efficiency at the cost of current throughput on the package. So the whole VRM right here is capable of delivering 180 amps uh, based on the limitation of the high side. The low side, it's doubled up uh, 6508, also from Alpha and Omega Semiconductor. And uh, they are rated for about 32 amps continuous, which I know that rating is garbage, but there's two of them. And your high side is way weaker. So, yeah. I, I really wouldn't worry about what these can actually handle in a VRM scenario. Which is why I didn't bother with doing the calculation, because ultimately you're going to be probably bouncing off of that limit before anything else. The other thing you're going to be bouncing off of is just the limitations of the Pascal silicon. So this is a GTX 1060, and according to Tech Power Up, th their specific sample of the gaming extreme pulled 135 watts power draw peak. And that's for the whole card. So say like 30 watts of that would be going to these guys, to the memory chips, which run at 1.5 volts. So that works to about 20 amps, which actually works out that this 30 amp memory VRM, which uses the exact same MOSFETs as the vCore VRM right here, 
um, can power that just fine. It doesn't have a huge amount of margin, but again, that's a, that's a package limit. So I'm not entirely sure if that's a hard limit or if you can exceed it in discontinuous operations. And we will actually, later on in the video, I'll show you where the package limited lim limit is written in the data sheet because there's a guy who's been arguing with me about whether or not these MOSFETs are package limited to 30 amps for a really long time. So we're going to go over that data sheet at the end of the video because I don't want to bore you with even more data sheet stuff right now. So yeah, memory VRM, a little bit underpowered in my opinion. I, I, I'd prefer to see, you know, well, I guess 60 amps is completely overkill, but 30 amps is in my opinion not quite enough. So 40 amps would have been nice. Thank you, Gigabyte. <laughs> But moving back to the core, if we chop off that 30 watts for the memory, then the core is going to run on about 1, 105 watts. Obviously, your fans also pull some power, but we'll just ignore that they exist. We'll just put those in that same 30 watts over there. But, you know, core pulls 105 watts, runs on about 1.05 volts, um, plus minus 0 0.5. Some cards come at 1 volt, some come at 1.1. Depends, depends on ASIC, depends on binning, overclock, whatever, factory overclocks, you know. That kind of thing, so I'm not entirely sure what exactly the card will come at, but basically the card should be running around 100 amps, which is 80%, which means, you know, you can increase the current draw by 80% before you hit the package limit. Gives you that. So, yeah. You know, th this VRM, even if I go by that miserable 30 amp rating, uh, is actually perfectly capable of you know, maxing out a GTX 1060 because um, NVIDIA really won't let you actually shove 80% more current into the GPU core uh, due to power limits. And you can't even power mod the card hard enough to get the power draw, like to get 80, 80, 100, 80 amps more on the, car, uh, on the V core. Because the other issue you run into is that Pascal doesn't really scale that well with voltage, and without a special BIOS, Pascal cards have a nasty tendency to shut down above 1.35 volts. So once you start exceeding 1.35 volts on the V-Core, they start to shut down, just black screen. Um, and there's not really any fix for that, because you can't mod the Pascal BIOS, and NVIDIA has been really, really not cooperative on approving modded bio like BIOSes that actually don't have that glitch. Uh, there's only a few cards that don't have that issue, and those would be things like the GTX 1060 Hall of Fame LN2 edition, which was used at the Galax Overclocking Carnival, uh, and the other Hall of Fame cards from Galax also should have special BIOSes available for them, though I'm not sure if those BIOSes would be available to the public. But I do know for a fact that those cards can go way higher on voltage than 1.35 volts. Most other cards start having issues at around 1.35, some on, at 1.3, some at 1.4. Really depends on the card you get. So, yeah. And it does require a BIOS fix. I do think the Asus ROG Strix 1080 also has a special BIOS for it, which fixes that somewhat. So... Yeah, so basically, between that 1.35 volt voltage limit and the power limit on the card itself, you're not getting 80% more current through the card because, well, 1.35 volts will give you about 35% more power, power draw, and then you'd have to increase the clock by... because clock also scales. Core clock basically leads to a linear increase in power draw, which is... Not 1 to 1, it's more like 1 to 8, 0.8. So for every 100 megahertz, so, so for every 10% core clock, you get about 8% power draw increase. Um, at least on the CPUs I tested it with. I've never tested GPUs. I think GPUs, it will actually be less than CPUs because uh, generally if you're core, increasing core clocks on GPUs, you don't see very huge differences in and power draw. Then again, I, you don't really crank up the core clock on a GPU as, as far as on a CPU. But yeah, you're basically never going to be able to reach that 180 amp figure. And even if you did reach that, that is the package limit. It is perfectly safe to run at that 180 amp figure pretty much from 0 to 125 degrees or even a b way well beyond that because again, this VRM right here is very, very, very efficient. Like these are really nice MOSFETs limited by that 30 amp package limit. So, yeah, 
you know, that VRM is going to run ice cold, should run ice cold, at least based on the data sheets, unless the data sheets are lying, which if data sheets were lying, then, you know, your life would suck. <laughs> to, uh, so I'm, I'm going to trust the data sheet on that. So yeah, pretty much, uh, as far as the VRM concerned, this card is great. So then, what can you do to make this card even greater, other than, of course, raising the core voltage? Well, if you want to raise the core voltage and not bounce off the power limit, you'll want to short this shunt, that shunt, and give me a second to switch, because there is a minor issue where I need to not use the tablet for switching from one image to another. And let me zoom out a bit, that shunt down here. In order to short them out, I either recommend soldering the same size shunt over them, so like this one down here, that is a 0, 0, 005, which means 5 milliohm. So you go and buy a 5 milliohm shunt, solder that over it. That'll give you a 50% power draw uh, decrease in, well, 50% power draw reading decrease uh, on this section of the card. Because each of those shunts is actually monitoring a different 12 volt input for the card. So this one will probably, this one's monitoring the power draw from your PCIe. So, you know. You might not want to mod that one specifically, but definitely the ones over by the 8-pin, you'll want to disable those. So, yeah. And if you don't want to solder onto your card, you can use liquid metal thermal pastes. And on that, uh, and out of those, I would recommend using Thermal Grizzly Conduct Knot, uh, because I've had one person send me a message where they said that they used Cool Laboratory Liquid Ultra, and the Cool Laboratory Liquid Ultra... Uh, ate the solder and the shunt fell off, which, you know, that, that's, that's a problem. You don't want shunts falling off your cards because then the power readings get, well, the card literally won't boot up because all of your 12 volt power is going through that shunt in order to measure how much power is going into the card. So if that falls off, you suddenly have no power going into the card, uh, which is a bit of a disaster and I expect most of you, and then soldering those back on is a massive, massive pain. So, yeah, you'll want to, use, like, I recommend using Conduct Knot because I've talked to Der Bauer about the shunt mod because he's done it way more than I've ever done it because I've never done it. I've copied the mod from him, and he basically told me that he's been using Conduct Knot, he's done it on 20 plus cards, he's never had a shunt fall off yet. So, if you want to mod the power limit, use Conduct Knot because, yeah. Uh, and the other thing he told me is he actually knows the chemical composition for Conduct Knot, and Conduct Knot just has no way of ever eating the solder, as far as he's concerned. Uh, I'm not sure if he has a chem degree, but I do believe he has a material science degree. Um, or mechanical engineering, one of those two. Something, something like, something metal related. <laughs> because he knows a lot about those topics, and he did go to university for it. Can't remember the specifics of the degree right now. And whereas the Cool Laboratory Liquid Ultra and Liquid Pro and all of the Cool Laboratory Liquid, you know, Liquid Metal Pastes don't have publicly available information on their composition. So who the hell knows what's in them? And, you know, some of that could very easily react with the tin that makes up lead-free solder um, almost entirely. So, yeah. That's pretty much it for the, the card, you know. We covered the vault mods, power mods, how good the VRM is. The VRM is perfectly good for a GTX 1060. Probably better than I said it was here, mostly because of that package limit thing in the data sheet, but I don't want to accidentally say the VRM can do more than it can actually do. Whereas if I underestimate the VRM, well, at least you'll never blow it up. That's, that's a positive. If I overestimate it, then, you know, you might destroy it. So, yeah. That's that for the part of this video focusing on the card. Now let's go read that data sheet and point out that package limit. So, oh wait, it's not the G6414, because there's a G written on the package. Oh, well, it's an AON6414, and therefore the other one is an AON6508. The thing is, Alpha Omega Semiconductor, if you just look, look up Alpha Omega Semiconductor 6414, it'll find this data sheet because this is the only 6414 labeled MOSFET they make. Um, you d generally, this number will be un unique to one MOSFET, even if it has a prefix like that. 
And that's true for most MOSFET manufacturers. I mean, there's plenty of numbers, you know. They're not going to run out anytime soon by splurging them around and giving uniques to uh, all their different products. So let's check out those package limits. So here we have the continuous drain current rating, which in a different video I said is the most, which in a different video I said is one of the most useless ratings on a data sheet. Except here we have something very interesting. So TC stands for case temperature. So that means temperature on top of the, you know, the ceramic of the MOSFET equals 25 degrees. So the MOSFET's at 25 degrees, 30 amps current limit. Under that, we have another 25 degrees MOSFET temperature, 50 amps current limit. And then under that, finally, we have 100 degrees, 30 amps current limit again. So this one we can pretty much ignore. The important thing is that we have two ratings for 25 degrees that aren't the same. And the reason for that is these notes right here, G and I. That's an I. So G and I are notes about those two measurements and those two tests. And they're actually, I'm not even sure if they test that. That's mostly calculated theoretical as far as I know. But some companies will actually go and do a submerge, uh, submerge the MOSFET in 25, in fluids that evaporate at 25 degrees and then, then do the test that way. Um, but a lot of the time, you know, they'll also just calculate it because it works generally enough. So, yeah, let's check out notes G and I. G, the maximum current rating is limited by the package. Well, rating is limited by package. They left out the the. And the maximum current rating is limited by silicon. So basically, that tells us that at 25 degrees case temperature, this MOSFET can handle 50 amps through the silicon. Okay, so that, that would be the actual, you know, part that's doing the switching. And the package, which is everything else in the MOSFET, so that, that's that metal padding, the ceramic casing, the metal pins everywhere, that's package. Those are all limited to 30 amps. And do understand that the package, the, the metal pins are probably not the part having a problem with 30 amps. It's probably what's going from those pins to the actual silicon itself. Because the, con because the way the silicon is connected is also part of the package, and that's probably what can't handle more than 30 amps. So, yeah, that's a bit of the, that's pretty much why I refuse to rate these above 30 amps in any video I do with them. Also, said guy who keeps complaining about me saying these MOSFETs are kind of, you know, not giving these MOSFETs a better review, uh, keeps listing the pulsed current rating, except again, he didn't read the freaking note. So this is notes, oops, Firefox's zoom functionality is really garbage. On, on PDFs. I should have used Adobe Reader for this. Anyway, pulse drain current. We have a note here. Note number C. And that's letter C, but whatever. Mm. Scroll down. Okay, could we zoom in, please? Garbage, thank you very much. C, repetitive rating. Pulse width limited by junction temperature of 150 degrees. So that's normal. That's m where most MOSFETs fail. Ratings are based on low frequency and duty cycles to keep the initial temperature of the junction at 25 degrees centigrade. This is a completely useless rating if you're looking at a VRM. First of all, VRMs never go back down in temperature. You don't turn them on and off, on and off, like you don't turn on the entire VRM, charge up a giant capacitor bank in a millisecond, and then let the VRM sit there until it is back at 25 degrees ambient, and then let it pull up back to 150. You don't run a VRM like that. What, what basically this is doing is they're running the MOSFET at such a low frequency and such a miserable duty cycle that they turn the MOSFET on, it very quickly hits 150 degrees uh, temperature, you know, 150 degrees centigrade on the junction. The junction being the silicon of, of, the, of the MOSFET, not the entire thing. The junction hits 150 degrees, at which point the junction, beyond that, the junction tends to disintegrate. Um, when it hits 150 degrees on the junction, they turn the MOSFET off and wait until the MOSFET's junction, so the silicon inside it, is back at 25 degrees, which takes forever, okay? 
That's why this is done at low frequency, because if they tried to do it at 100 kilohertz, or 200 kilohertz, or 300 kilohertz, the MOSFET would melt. It would literally melt, which is why this 140 amp pulse drain current rating is completely freaking useless when talking about a VRM. Okay? It's because that 140 amp pulse drain current rating is pretty much like the best possible scenario for pulsing current through the MOSFET. The only way this could get better is if they were cooling it with something ridiculous to make sure that the MOSFET never actually gets very hot. But I think they're already doing that because it manages to pull down back to 25 degrees pretty quick. Um, so, yeah. That's that. That's why this MOSFET always gets locked at 30 amps in every single video I do with it. It's because the, car, the, the package is literally limited to 30 amps, the pulse rating doesn't matter, and this is true for all MOSFETs because this methodology Damn it, what am I pressing? Oh, right, that's the macro for spacebar. Oops. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, this testing methodology of repetitive rating with low frequency and terrible duty cycles to keep the TJ at 25 degrees initially is very, very popular. Pretty much every MOSFET manufacturer out there uses that same stupid rating, right? And they just go like, yeah, this is the pulse rating and it's done with that test. When do you need to do that? I'd love to know. It's like the only application I could think of where this might be a useful rating is like a rail gun. You know, because you temporarily need a lot of current and then you, you, you can let it sit for, you know, a couple seconds and then fire it up again. <laughs> because for any other scenario, this just doesn't work. Or at least any other scenario I can think of. Like you're never going to turn a MOSFET on, let it hit 150 degrees internally which you can't even measure, then wait for it to cool back down to 25 degrees so you can turn it on until it hits 150 again. Like, what the hell is that? So, yeah, that 140 amp pulsed current rating is completely useless. The case, the packaging is limited to 30 amps. And, and, and past that, I, I just, yeah, don't know how to deal with it. I tried to look into uh, how to deal with low... Uh, low package current ratings and I couldn't find anything uh, useful and I figured well maybe I could just you know assume that the package just behaves like a bit of wire and so if you just average out the amount of current you're pulsing through it it'll it'll work out but on the other hand I have no idea if that's the case I, I and I don't know if maybe you know if the pulse if a high current pulse going through those those wires starting at a higher temperature couldn't maybe you know destroy the package before it turns off or if for whatever reason it just doesn't work out i don't want to overestimate a vrm i'd rather underestimate stuff and have it survive rather than overestimate stuff and let it blow up and that's generally why i still haven't killed any of the horrifically terrible motherboards i've used okay and i've used four phase am3 plus boards and run some dangerously high overclocks on them, which I would not recommend to anybody else, but, you know, all the boards survived because I would know that I'm working with garbage and I treat garbage like garbage. And this right here isn't garbage, but this rating is very concerning. And I don't know how to get around it, so we'll, we'll, we'll stick with that. So that's that. Thank you for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave a comment about anything you didn't like in the video, including the card. You can dislike the card. I think it looks awful. This is a terrible PCB. And they're wasting money on stupid ports. Uh, and I said like, share, subscribe. So that means that leaves follow me on Facebook. Um, check out the blog. I will be doing an update on the RX480 Strix very soon. Probably tomorrow, actually depending on how destroyed I feel tomorrow, because today I've been feeling really, really tired. Um, and uh, one last thing, I have a Patreon. If you would like to support what I do here at Actually Hardcore Overclocking, then, you know, go down in the description and, and, and click on the Patreon link and you can patronize me. There's also actually a PayPal email address that you can now send money to directly as well if you want to do one-time donations. And you can, of course, also spam that email address because, well, it is mine and I don't really have a choice <laughs> if you want to spam it or not. So, 
Yeah, though I probably won't answer anything that goes into that email address. You're probably better off uh, sending me a PM over YouTube or dropping a comment down in, under the video or a message on Facebook because I monitor all of those, whereas that email sort of exists just because PayPal screwed me over on my last PayPal account. And it's not because of taking too much money or anything. It's because I made that PayPal account when I was 16, and they realized that when I did some authentication stuff, they were like, oh, you were 16 when you made this account? Well, we're going to turn it off now that you're 19. And I'm just sitting there going like, what the hell's the point of that? And then they tell me that if I want to continue using their services, I just need to go make another email. At which point, I just wanted to bash my head into the table. But hey, PayPal going to PayPal, and I still need to use, you know, they're convenient, so... I put up with that crap, and you now get an email address that might get might end up getting used for, you know, stuff. I have no idea what I'm going to use it for yet, other than the PayPal right now. So that's that for this video. Thank you for watching, and see you next time.